I would like to share with you a tale of two very different futures. One of these futures is bright and shining. The other, the second future, is dismal and disappointing. And so I also want to share with you some things I've learned recently in school that may help us find our way to the brighter, more appealing future. Because this first future is indeed bright, it represents the triumph of technology over adversity. In this bright future, we've finally realized the full potential of digital technology, ubiquitous networking, cloud computing, big data, the Internet of Things. And we've harnessed the huge flows of data from billions of sensors in our homes, in our cars, in our street lights, even our bodies, to make us healthier, safer, and more secure, but also more energy efficient. So fossil fuel consumption is down because we've increased the efficiency with which we distribute renewable energy. The smart grid and other innovations allow us to make the best of renewable energy. Fossil fuel consumption down, pollution down. Global tension down as more countries around the world become energy independent. And in this bright and shining future, Illness and disease are in retreat because of advances in uh, genetic medicine made possible by affordable supercomputing. And telemedicine is improving the quality of life in rural communities around the world. Societies long neglected are thriving thanks to technologies like universal broadband wireless and distance learning. So this bright future is indeed very appealing something to work for. But first of all, to get there, we're going to have to get out of the ditch. Okay, because the second future, it's, it's not the cyber apocalypse that some people have talked about. It's just more of the same, more of what we have today, which is digital products that don't really deliver, that are unsafe for their intended purpose, that have security holes in them. This vehicle's in the ditch because it was shipped with a big hole in the security of the onboard computer system. That security hole enabled an attacker from miles away to take control of the vehicle using just a cell phone and a laptop. And somebody made the decision that it was OK to ship this product with this problem, that the risk of this was acceptable. And we talk about it as though it's a security problem, which it is, but it's also, I think, a safety issue. You know, and when we ship products to the public, there were 1.4 million vehicles like this out there, we're shipping unsafe products. And unfortunately, there are tens of millions of unsafe products out there at the moment. At home, when we get the internet, a lot of us get it out of a router. The router is what serves up the internet at home to our laptops, uh, our smartphones, our tablets, our smart TVs, our smart refrigerators, our thermostats, our nanny cams. And unfortunately, a lot of these routers have holes in them, holes that the bad guys are only too happy to exploit to steal information, to send spam and sell illegal products, or to attack other systems on the internet. And we actually walk around with a bunch of these digital holes, these security vulnerabilities in our pockets. Right. This tells me that I have email from my bank, but I don't. It's email from some guy who wants to steal my money. Uh, it tells me I've got a message from my favorite airline. My frequent flyer miles are about to expire unless I click here. <laughs> but I don't want to click there because it's some guy who's trying to scam me. And so what are we going to do about this? How are we going to avoid being stuck in the ditch and stuck in this disappointing future? A future where we don't know which information we can trust. We don't know whether or not somebody's going to expose our most personal information. We live in fear of the technology. We don't trust the technology. But I think one of the things we've obviously got to work on 
is cybercrime and cybercriminals. And a few years ago, I started to say, when we catch these guys, and unfortunately, it's mainly guys, when we catch these guys, we need to lock them up for a long time. Lock them up and throw away the key. And my wife, who has studied network security and many forms of cyber badness for a long time, said, well, how do you know harsher sentences will work as a crime deterrent? <laughs> it was a good question because I didn't have an answer. I, I didn't know. So I decided to go back to school, and I used one of those bright and shining pieces of technology, distance learning, to enroll in the criminology department at the University of Leicester, uh, which is in England, just down the road from where my mom lives. And I quickly learned in criminology that people have been studying this problem for decades. What works as a deterrent? And it turns out that harsher sentences don't work well as a deterrent. Well, why is that? Well, if you look at the research, a lot of criminals just don't think they'll get caught. And if you're not going to get caught, the sentence doesn't really matter. What does work is a greater expectation that you will be caught. And that put me in mind of something that we can maybe do. You know, let's push for more resources for law enforcement, not only to catch more of these bad guys, but to catch them quicker. That does work as a deterrent, I think. But that's not the only thing I learned in criminology. I also learned about the connection between the opportunity for crime and crime generation. I learned about something called routine activity theory. And this was developed in the 1970s when there was a huge crime wave in this country at a time of relative prosperity. This was kind of confusing. Well, some sociologists studied different types of crime relative to changes in routine activity. You know, there were less people at home during the day. There were more valuable consumer products around to be stolen and sold for money by thieves. And routine activity theory came up with this very prescient statement. The opportunity for predatory crime appears to be enmeshed in the opportunity structure for legitimate activities. When I saw that phrase, opportunity structure for legitimate activities, I thought, that's the internet. And it's full of opportunities for crime because of the security holes in all of these digital products. So what can we do about that? Well, maybe we should show, as consumers, our preference for more secure products. If you talk to the people who make digital products, a lot of them will say, consumers won't pay for security. Well, maybe if we showed by our buying preferences a preference for secure products, that might help. For example, if you're thinking maybe of getting a new router, go for the one that has the security features up front on the box. And if, if you're wondering why, why don't they all have security front and center, well, there's another theory that can maybe explain that. That's the cultural theory of risk perception. Again, developed in the 70s as a way to understand why it is that different groups of people have different perceptions of the hazard involved in technology. You know, if you ask people about uh, pollution and oh, maybe climate change, you know, some people see risk, others don't. Why is that? Well, an anthropologist was able to map this against how we align ourselves culturally, all right? So our connection to community, our sense of hierarchy, our sense of individualism, these affect how we see risk. And they came up with something pretty interesting. There's one group of people that consistently underestimate risk, white males. And it's actually called the white male effect. And in study after study, you can see this. The line representing white male perception of risk is lower than that of females, it's lower than that of non-white males and non-white females. When I saw that, I thought, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> Who dominates the tech industry? White males. But then my wife asked me another good question. She said, well, what about the people who are working to make technology safer? And, and she had a good point because nine out of 10 people involved in cybersecurity today are male and most of us are very white. And so I had to do a bit more research. I looked into the studies, and apparently there's one group of males that skew the whole picture. About 30% of males who tend to be affluent, well-educated, aligned with 
elements of hierarchy and individualism drastically underestimate the risk in technology. And let me give you an example. Suppose you run a car company that sells a lot of diesel engine cars. <laughs> Suppose those diesel engines are subject to tough emissions tests. What are you going to do about that? Well, you steal a trick from the cybercrime playbook. Right? Cyber criminals, if they want to get onto your system, they want to get their malicious code into your system, they will have that code behave itself if it's being tested. So that you know, a malware researcher or an anti-malware detection program, it will behave itself. And that's what they did with the emission control software. When the test's being run, it behaves itself. And I'm pretty sure that the people at that car company who decided the risk of that strategy was acceptable were mainly white and mainly male. And that brings me to something that I think we can do something about. Let's get more women and minorities into technology. So there I can offer some hope. Let me tell you about something called Cyber Boot Camp. This is a fantastic program here in San Diego, an educational program for high school and middle school students, five days of intense instruction in cybersecurity. And this year, 40% of the students who made it to the class were girls. And this is more than ever before. So I'm going to... So I want to share a video, uh, just a few seconds of what they had to say. This year, it's been almost 50-50 ratio. It's like 40 to 60 girls to, to boys. They're back with reinforcements. I do believe girls do bring something uh, unique into the field because we think it differently. Like, guys have their own way of thinking, and then we have our own way of thinking. We understand what cyber is about. I think it's just going to do good to the cyber world in general, and females will definitely play a huge role in it. I think probably in the field, from the speakers I've seen, it is a pretty male-dominated field. but. I think I'd still try to go in anyways. I feel it's cool that if a female goes into this field, it gives her a sort of power. We're definitely getting more into it, and that's good, because we can do anything that men can do. So this represents, I think, hope. Hope that we can make it to that bright and shining future. And there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done going to have to work on a lot of things. But there are three things that we can work on now. You know, we can work to get more resources to law enforcement to catch more cyber criminals more quickly. As consumers, we can use our buying power to choose safer, more secure products. And as members of this wonderfully diverse society of ours, we can get more women and minorities involved in decision-making in technology. Thank you.